Monique Rhodes. Wow, that I really enjoyed talking to Monique. Um, her title is kind of a happiness strategist. But how do you look at happiness? How do you look at it? Is happiness when you know you get the job or get the family or you know um, get the spouse or you know is it out of your control? You know, Monique brings it back in together, and you know, happiness should be uh, you know within. You know, we all live in our spaces and you know our apartments, and houses, etc. But her point is, we're actually living in our mind, and how often do we clean it up? She talks a lot about meditation. She does a form of meditation that I've never heard of before. It's it's very very interesting. Uh, I look forward to you uh, hearing it and and getting your feedback. Uh, you're going to hear a, just a completely diff- different perspective on happiness and discipline, and how discipline is. Uh, arrived at with happiness. She has a term that I've never heard before. Choose a plan. You're going to hear about that. But um, fascinating woman. She she's also a musician. She toured. She opened for Chuck Berry at one point. It's just a, a fascinating woman with an incredible perspective. How she got into teaching other happiness is is a wild story. Why, just a little teaser. She was India. She was in India. Some some people at a coffee shop. She used to meditate on the roof. Some people saw her doing that and started asking her, and she wouldn't want to do it. And then all of a sudden, more and more people. It's just a fascinating woman. You're also going to learn about dogs and goats. But just Monique Rhodes, happiness, how to get there, bring it all in. Thanks so much for listening. Hi, I'm Joey Pins. People ask me, how did I lose 130 pounds? The quick answer is always discipline. I started my business, wasn't paying attention to my health, was eating too much, you know, drinking too much sweets. My daughter was born. Next thing I know, I'm pre-diabetic, I have hypertension. I knew something had to change. Discipline. I, like many of you, had faced many challenges in your career, in your family, in your life faith. How did you attack them? How did you approach them? How did you solve them? Hopefully it all had to have some degree of discipline. I'm also asked, how did you found and start a tech business that lasted over 25 years? Discipline. I was committed to it, enjoyed technology, didn't enjoy some aspects of it, but knew it was necessary. Discipline. Our podcast mission, how do we use discipline to better ourselves and society. Join me, please, as I talk to interesting people and discuss how they use discipline in their family and their passion and their careers and how it helped them. Our podcast vision, growth through learning from others. Joey Pins Discipline Conversations. It'll be light and serious. Join us, please. Thank you for consideration. My goodness, Monique Rhodes, thank you so much for doing this. And, uh, Thanks for your time today. Is should happiness be a goal? Why not? Why not, Joey? You know, we're we're born into this world and we're living in this world and life is tough. Why not have happiness as a goal? You know, it, do you have a reason why we wouldn't? When I talk to people. They often say happiness shouldn't be a goal. You should have, you know, other goals that will bring you happiness. I, I get pushback when I talk to people about happiness as actual and as an actual strategy. But that's not your, not not your uh, not your bag, is it? Not at all. Of course, there are lots of there are lots of things that we can set up our lives to do that will bring us happiness, but we're still still talking about the same thing. Mm. You know, we, you're still saying, well, we shouldn't have happiness as a goal, but if we fulfill other goals that we'll be happy. So happiness still is the goal, Mm. isn't it? And it's a goal, whether we're conscious of it, whether we want to recognize it or not, of course, it's a goal. When you choose a particular job, you choose a particular job because you want to be happy. When you you don't go and choose a partner, a husband or a wife who's going to make you unhappy. So unconsciously, we're consistently 
moving ourselves towards wanting to be happy, whether or not we consciously say we are or not, hmm. right? Hmm. Yeah, that is true. Oftentimes in business, you know, I'm involved with peer groups and in business, you know, we say, I, I hear peers often say, you know, uh, trying to get this particular project, I, you know, hope I get it. And everybody always says, hey, hope is not a strategy. You know, uh, what are you going to do to get to it? So is that similar as hope being a strategy? Is happiness being a strategy? No, because happiness is something that we can actually set up for ourselves. Mm. I think that's a thing that people don't understand is that, you know, if I say, okay, I, there's, this, there's this company, I'm hoping to do a deal with it, that is actually a hope. Whereas happiness is something that we can shift. You might get the deal or you might not. You might, you know, uh, marry the gorgeous woman. You might not, right? There's kind of chance there. Actually, happiness, unbeknownst to most people, is something that we have much, much, much more control of. Mm. It's not something that's at the whim of other people if we learn how to work with ourselves so that we can be more consistent with raising our happiness levels. Does that make sense? I, you, you can only control what you can control. You know, one of your, your podcasts is great. You give these kind of, you know, tight kind of dialogues with a particular theme. And one that I, that I really liked was one of, uh, some, one of your friends had a neighbor that was bothering them and was really kind of ruining their, I wouldn't say ruining their life, but making them, um, them unhappy. And again, that's something they couldn't control that person, that neighbors, you know, the way they work and where they come from and how they operate. But you're saying it's really up to your friend to decide to be happy or not. The thing is this, Joey, and this is where your example works in perfectly. I hope that I'm going to get the deal because I believe that, that getting that deal will make me happy. Mm. Right? What happens is this, right? I'm working in business. I hope I'm going to get this deal. I want you to get that deal, right? But the moment that you pin your happiness on whether or not you get that deal, you're giving your happiness away to external circumstances, hmm. Hmm. right? And what I teach is that actually happiness truly is an inside job. Happiness is about our habits. So when we say, well, I hope I get the deal and then we don't get the deal and then we feel miserable, we have pinned our happiness on an external circumstance. But it's the same. You meet this gorgeous girl. Oh, my God, my life is going to be so awesome. It's going to be so perfect. You're so excited. You pin all your happiness on it. And six months in, you have your first fight. Mm. And all of a sudden, it doesn't feel so good. And then all of a sudden, there's some other cracks. And then what happens, Joey? We start looking for the next thing the next thing that's going to lift our happiness levels up. And this is how we end up a little bit like a rat running around on a wheel in a cage because we're constantly chasing the next, what I call as soon as happiness thing. As soon as I get that deal, I'll be happy. As soon as I buy this house, I'll be happy. As soon as I marry the person of my dreams, I'm going to be happy. And what you're doing is giving your happiness away to external forces that are unreliable. Hmm. The, the deal falls through. Oh, okay, I'm not happy. The girl ends up being an alcoholic and you can't stay with her. Oh, I'm not happy, right? And this is how it works. So instead, we need to find a, hmm. a happiness that's much more consistent, a happiness that isn't going to be blown around by whatever weather is happening externally. And I think that's one of the biggest things for us to understand is that happiness truly is internal rather than reliant on external circumstances. Those, those external circumstances, those external things that happen give us a boost. They make us feel good and they, for a moment, they make us feel happy. Mm. But it's not a lasting happiness, Joey. And that's the difference. Happiness is internal. Yes. 
It's very interesting. You know, my daughters are, are, are older now and, you know, one just graduated college and the other one's in college. And I, and I think to myself, I always just spend some time with them and I think to myself, what do I want for them? And I, and I always come back to happiness. I want happiness for them. I want them to be happy. Uh, I can't control that. And it would make me happy if they were happy. But again, you're saying that's more external. It's nothing I can really control. Obviously. You can you can give your daughters everything in the world and they may not be happy. Right. You can give your daughters nothing and they may be happy. Mm. And this is what I saw. You know, I, I traveled the world for most of my life yeah. and we believe that happiness is really about comfort a lot of the time. Hmm. If I have enough money to create the comforts that I need, then I'll be happy. The comfortable car, the comfortable house, the comfortable job, right? But it's interesting that in the West, where we have so many resources to buy this comfort, hmm. we're looking at stress, anxiety, and depression levels that are going <laughs> through the roof like we've never seen before. In fact, the World Health Organization pre-COVID said that by 2030, depression would be the biggest health problem facing human beings, surpassing obesity. Okay, wow. that is eight years away. And in between that statistic coming out, we've had a COVID epidemic, <laughs> pandemic. So now we're looking at uh, uh, a Western culture in particular where we have so many resources and yet we have a mental health crisis that is massive. So we start to then be able to see that all of these things don't kind of match up. All the comfort, all, the, all of the things that we believe we've got entertainment on tap, we've, we've just got so much on tap, and still we're not happy. In fact, worse than that, hmm. we're unhappier than ever. And yet when I go to third world countries, I see happiness quite differently. Of course, wow. there's misery and suffering, right? But also, there is happiness in measures that I don't see anymore in the West. So then we have to ask ourselves, what is going on here? Why is it that we have all the ability to create what we believe are the circumstances for us to be happy, and we're not doing it? One of the stories I like to tell Joey is a few years ago, I went to Las Vegas and I saw Lady Gaga perform and my gosh, she was amazing. She did this, you know, kind of jazz, big band, Tony Bennett style show. It was unbelievable. And we look at the circumstances. Here she is. She has one of the things we believe or we're taught to believe will make us happy, fame. Mm. She's wealthy. She was getting paid $1 million per show. And some days she was doing two shows a day. She's powerful. She's beautiful. She's talented. She's got Academy Awards. She's got Grammy Awards. Mm. She's got everything. And what struck me was the conversation that she had with the audience about how desperately unhappy she was. Mm. And we see this across the board with a lot of people who have all the trappings of what we believe will make us happy are often incredibly unhappy, so much so that many of them are addicts, many of them end up dying from addiction or suicide or whatever. So hang on a second. They've got all the things that we're led to believe will make us happy. So when you think about your daughters and you think, well, I really want them to be happy, it can be easy for us to think, what, what is it that I need to do to help them to be happy? It's probably not, you know, material things. Mm. Will probably might make a small difference, but really is not going to be the deciding factor. Yeah, I I already blame myself for uh, you know raising the bar too high for you know men that they're going to date, and so I'm always riddled with no. That's just that's just a joke. Uh, but is the opposite <laughs> of happiness depression? And sadness, hmm. you know, I think that 
I think that one of the biggest things I'm seeing at the moment is there's an incredible amount of sadness. Maybe we also look at the word despair, mm. that there's yeah. despair, depression, sadness, despair, frustration. These are, these are some of the, the things that we see coming through that people are feeling at the moment. People feeling stuck. People feeling stuck in their life and not knowing how can I shift, how can I move forward. Yeah, and I mean, you talk about meditation. And, you know, let's talk about getting happy, Monique, you know, so you, you talk about meditation, you talk, you, it, you do it with your eyes open, which I've never, I've never known anyone to do that before. Uh, but t how does that help with happiness? Yeah, it's a great question. Okay. So one of the first things to understand is this. Imagine it like this, like you wake up in the morning and you take a shower and you brush your teeth and you you know, make sure your house is nice and tidy and your space is nice and tidy and you've got clean clothes on. All of these things make us feel good, don't mm. they? Mm. Right? And yet, if we think about it, we don't actually live in our office. We don't live in our house. We don't even live in our clothes. The place that we're living in is in our mind. Mm. And when was the last time you cleaned out your mind? Probably never. Instead, what we're doing is we are filling our minds with so much junk. Like I imagine it, Joey, like you have this, let's say you have this big room in your house. That's your mind, right? And you've left all the doors and windows open, mm. everything open for years and years on end. Everything comes in. Wonderful things, terrible things. That room is just disgusting. And that's what our minds are like. We, we open ourselves up to so much senseless, mindless, unnecessary information, particularly since the age of the internet, mm. that we are filling our minds with. And our minds are just filthy. We never clean them out. We <laughs> never give them a break. And then we wonder... Why are we suffering from so much stress, anxiety, and depression? So meditation becomes really important. I, I call meditation my superpower. Meditation becomes really important because what it does is a number of things. It starts to give us a chance to do some internal cleaning of the mind. It gives us the chance to slow down, and it gives us the chance to get to know ourselves. So at the moment, we don't know ourselves at all. You know, we go through our day and whenever there's a difficult emotion or we're bored or anything, what do we do? We pick up the phone and we start distracting ourselves from being in that difficult emotion. Mm -hmm. And so what we're teaching ourselves and what, what we're teaching our kids is, you know, it, it's, it's a little bit like... Uh, if you don't feel good, go to the liquor cabinet. Hmm. This is our liquor cabinet. It's right here and we use it consistently. So the way that meditation works is this. Our mind is constantly dancing between three places. The present moment, thoughts of the past and thoughts of the future. So if you think about it like this, Joey, hmm. thoughts of the past are actually just imaginings because we know that if the two of us are in the exact same situation, you're going to remember certain details and I'm going to remember certain details and they'll be different. And that's based on the filters of our mind. So if we look at our memories of the past, we can see that they're actually just imaginings based on the particular filters that the information runs through in our mind. So we can really say that the past is, well, it's over and it's just an imaginary past. The future hasn't come yet. That too is completely imaginary. Hmm. So the only moment that is truly real is this present moment. Hmm. And most of us struggle to live in it. We're living in imaginings of the past and imaginings of the future. And we are struggling to stay in the present moment. 
So if I was to enable you to be in the present moment as much as possible, even for just 10 minutes a day, what you will start to learn is how to be here. Hmm. And then the mind starts to settle down. All the thoughts of the future start to settle. All the thoughts of the past start to settle. And in a meditation practice, what we're doing is we're setting you up for the rest of the day. So we're setting you up so that you begin your day grounding and settling your mind so that when you're having a conversation, you're actually in the conversation. When you're writing an email, you're writing the email. When you're playing with your kids, you're playing with your kids. Hmm. And then this exhausted mind that normally is dancing between these three places starts to have a chance to, to settle down. And you also start to begin to see all of the stuff that you've accumulated that sits in there and is running around and around like a record. And you have the ability to start working with beginning to clean this mind of yours out. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So meditation is the, is the path to get there. Yes. It's the path to come to the present moment which is the only moment that exists. It's the path to get to know yourself so that you're less afraid of yourself. It's the path, Joey, I'm sitting in meditation and I have emotions, which we all do. Hmm. I'm anxious about something and I have the ability to stay when that emotion arises. Because what most people do in their daily life now is emotion arises and they're like, I'm out of here. I need to distract myself because I'm afraid of this emotion. So in meditation, when the emotion rises up, we start to see, oh, it has a natural lifespan. It will rise up and then it will settle back down again. And when you see that happen in meditation, then when that arises in your daily life, you're less inclined to run away from it. Wow. You can handle your emotions. And the same thing with your thoughts. You start to see that your thoughts rise up. I always compare it to the waves in the ocean. The waves are such a natural part of the ocean. They rise up and they go back down again. If we allow our thoughts just to rise, see them as a natural part of our mind and not chase after them, not cling on to them like we do, like, I just heard a dog barking, right? And the mind, instead of just going, oh, there's a dog barking, the mind starts to run, right? Hmm. And it goes, there's a dog bark. I wonder whose dog? I wonder if that's Sue's dog out there. And is my dog going to start barking in the middle of the podcast? Hmm. Okay. And that's what our mind does. Whereas if we can just hear the sound, there's a dog barking and leave it, the thought naturally dissolves back into our mind. And this is what meditation teaches us. So then this mind that is so tired, so stressed, so anxious has a chance to relax and breathe and just be in the only moment that exists, which is right here. And very, very quickly, what you see is your happiness levels start to rise hmm. because all of the stress is starting to slowly but surely be alleviated from the mind remembering that the mind is the ordering principle. The mind decides our happiness or our suffering, not our external circumstances. So when we start to shift our relationship with our mind, our relationship with our whole life, our whole external circumstances begins to change. Should meditation be assisted or unassisted? Meditation should be something that you learn. Hmm. So that's a really important thing to understand. We're in a modern world now, and there's a lot of people that either try and meditate by themselves with no instruction or meditate with someone who is maybe gone and done a weekend course on meditation. All right. Meditation is so much deeper than people realize as you pull the layers back of getting to know yourself. Hmm. So it is vital that you are taught. You can't just say, you know, I had someone recently say, well, I sit for 20 minutes every day. 
And as we explored it, we found that what she was doing was ruminating for 20 minutes a day. Hmm. That is not meditation. So it is something that you need to be taught from a qualified teacher. And the apps that you can get and the, the YouTube videos with, with assisted meditation you recommend or not? Absolutely. Without a doubt. Yes. You can go to a meditation class or obviously you can also now learn online, which is fantastic. Mm. Yes, definitely. But be aware that there's a difference between what sometimes is called meditation that's more creative visualization. Mm. Imagine yourself lying next to a stream. That's not meditation. That is taking you off somewhere else to relax the mind. Hmm. Okay. And that's perfect. And that has its place and that's wonderful. But meditation is really about waking up. It's about waking you up to the present moment that you are asleep to most of the time, which is brings me to your point about open eye meditation. Okay. That's right. Sorry about that. That's all right. So open eye meditation is really interesting. There are a number of ways that you can meditate. One of them is closed eye. The other is open eye. All right. The reason that I do open eye meditation is because in meditation, I don't want to get sleepy. I'm someone that can fall asleep really, really quickly. So I don't want to be sleepy. I want to be awake. By practicing with open eye meditation, there is a lot less chance of the mind becoming sleepy because you want to be alert. All right. You want to be relaxed, but alert. And so for some people, they can do that with closed eye meditation. For me, open eye meditation is the way to do it. And I just, you just look at a 90 degree angle down, you rest your gaze gently on something and you keep yourself awake so that there is no separation hmm. between your meditation practice and your daily life. So that, because the aim is not this, the aim is not, I'm going to go off into this place and I'm going to meditate for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, whatever, and then come back into the world. It's like, I want you to wake up to the world. I want you to wake up to being here so that you learn when you're meditating, that you can transfer that really easily into, I'm having a conversation, hmm. right? Ideally, as you are having a conversation, you are in the mindset of meditation where you are keeping your focus on exactly what it is that, you know, this conversation right now, and it's not dancing off anywhere and you bring it back and it dances off and you bring it back right? So that then meditation is not just when you're sitting for 10 minutes at the beginning of the day. It's that you're bringing it into your whole life. Hmm. Wow. It's just completely transformative. Yeah, because I, I, I go through spurts where I meditate for weeks and months and then I, I stop the habit. I'm not quite sure why. And then I'm reminded again and I pick it back up. But it, I, I often think it's, yeah, it's just a kind of time to be away, but I, I generally do it with eyes closed and I do kind of drift off. I wonder if I should try that, just keeping your eye open and just fixing on something. It's very, because I actually come to think about it, a lot of times I do get tired afterwards. Yes, this is not about falling asleep. Mm. So that again is where being taught is really powerful because you want to be relaxed. You want your mind to be relaxed. You want your body to be relaxed. But it was described to me, you know, almost like a, I'm a guitarist, like the string of a guitar. You don't want it too loose and you don't want it too tight, right? You just, you get the best sound when it's not too loose and too tight. Mm. And that's how you want to be. You don't want to be sleepy and you don't want to be agitated. Right. So you keep yourself nice and relaxed. And yeah, I mean, I, I just, uh, Joey, I used to go and when I was first trying to learn to meditate, I'd go to these meditation courses. It was so bad. They would say, close your eyes. And without about within about 10 seconds, I would feel my head nodding mm. and I would get so stressed and anxious. And it's actually the um, hmm. Tibetan Buddhist tradition that teaches open eye meditation. And I was taught under the tradition. Tibetan Buddhist tradition to meditate. And this is where I was introduced to open eye meditation and it changed everything for me. 
Wow. It made it much more accessible to me and much easier for me to bring into my daily life as well. Meditation, one of the foundations for happiness. Without a doubt. Why? Because the mind is the ordering principle. Hmm. And what meditation does is it teaches you how to train, tame, and get to know your mind. Hmm. If you want to be happy consistently, you have to get that wild pony of a mind of yours under control because that is what is creating your happiness or your unhappiness. If you wake up in the morning and you're feeling like, ugh, this is not a good day, that's all in the mind. And it doesn't matter what happens externally, your day is not going to be great. If you wake up in the morning, you're like, I feel awesome. You're going to have an awesome day, even if things are difficult. It is all dependent on how your mind is. So working with your mind and, and, and getting to know it and learning how to work with your thoughts and emotions is absolutely 100% the foundational key to happiness. Hmm. I took your uh, happiness quiz. And, yes. uh, I got an uh, 18 and so that's kind of a baseline now. So that's your hat you, and it'll make you feel better. Let's talk about that. Yeah. What's your question? So uh, why, how does it determine a baseline? The quiz. The most important thing is for us to look at where's your starting point, mm. right? And anything so that, you know, uh, 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 you know, in the kind of work that I do, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, you know, things can be a little bit woo woo. And I am just so the opposite of that. I'm like, let's have a beginning point and let's have an end point. Hmm. Let's do work in between so we can measure where you get to and where you're at. So we have a course called the happiness baseline where we take people through an eight week process. We test them at the beginning with the Penn State University Happiness Inventory, which is the standard test to see where someone's happiness is at. Hmm. Then we test them at the end, right? Because I want people to be able to see a shift in their results. We have a 100% success rate so, in yeah. shifting every single person who completed this course. And that's where it's really good because sometimes we, we do something hmm. And we think, I think I progressed, but did I or did I not? I can promise you people see huge progress in this course, but it's also wonderful to be able to see that quantified as well by statistics, you know, by having a quiz that tests you properly rather than just hopeful, wishful thinking. How did you uh, arrive to this? You have quite a fascinating history, Monique. I mean, you... You, you traveled the world, you, you're a musician, you opened for Chuck Berry at one point. I mean, uh, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. How did you arrive to, you know, to, I know you've had some tragedy too as a youth. And um, how did you arrive to setting happiness as a goal? Because I knew that if I didn't shift where I was at, I wasn't going to make it. Hmm. It was... It was, you know, that point of desperation at 19 where I was in a hospital bed having tried to take my own life right. because my I was so out of control and I didn't understand what was going on. And there was no one, there was no one that was able to truly help me to see what was going on. And I looked at my friends and I thought, they just seem to be happy. Hmm. Like, why is it that I'm struggling so much? And it became such a burning question for me that I decided that I was going to literally see was was it was it that there was something wrong with me which I thought there was was there something wrong with me or was it possible to shift this hmm. and because things were so desperate I started on a journey of desperation and and as I went on it I began to get get some answers along the way and literally what I did Joey was I I looked at different cultures and different philosophies and saw ways that people were living started to question why people in really poor countries seem to 
predominantly be much happier than us in the West. And so I looked for keys. And then I began to look at experimenting with myself, finding things, finding pieces of information, and then testing things out on myself. And I literally used myself as an experiment. And as the years went by, I saw myself shift and change. And, you know, I hoped to get back to a place where everyone else was at. That's all I dreamed of. If mm -hmm. I could just get to a happiness level that everyone else seems to have, that would be awesome. But I, in the end, kind of did the Everest of it. And, you know, sometimes I wake up and I think to myself, if I wasn't me, I would be jealous of myself. Mm -hmm. You know, like there's a happiness that's available to us that I didn't know existed. It wasn't just to get to normality. It's that actually we can go so much further than that. There was um, experiments done uh, some years ago at UCLA in, in Los Angeles on some, uh, some people who had meditated for long periods of time. And actually one of them was the translator for the Dalai Lama, um, Matthew Rickard. Uh, and, they they put uh they put all of the um you know stuff on his head to measure his mm. brain and when they did it they went and reset all their equipment because they thought that there was a problem they thought there was a problem with their equipment because the areas of his brain that where they recognized that happiness lies in the brain was so much larger than anything they had ever seen in their life wow. They couldn't actually believe it. And it was from years of meditation. He's often known as the happiest man in the world, hmm. right? So what we can see then is that this work of working with our mind actually changes the structure of our brain. How extraordinary is that? So this is what I was experimenting with, N not only meditation, but other things that I teach in the Happiness Baseline to help to look at, okay, what is it that I can use to shift so that now, you know, not only do I wake up every morning so excited about the day, but difficult things happen. Of course they do. Like I'm a human being and difficult things, painful things still happen, but they don't affect me in the same way that they used to. They, the, the pain, like I still experience sadness and pain and frustration and all of those things, but they last for a short amount of time mm. rather than days, weeks, or months. They might last for half an hour, you know, because I know how to work with my mind and my emotions now so that I allow those emotions to be, but I don't drown in them anymore. Is spirituality a necessity for happiness? No, absolutely not. But is it helpful? Yes. If we look at the work of Brene Brown, what we see is that she, you know, did all this research about, um, I can't remember what she calls them, well, well hearted people or whole hearted people or something like that. Basically, she was looking to see, you know, what were the elements of people who were happy. And what she found was that some sort of spiritual belief was one of the common denominators and hmm. the people I think she calls them wholehearted and the people that she found to be the most well in the world. So I don't see it as a necessity. Do I see it as something that often is incredibly helpful? Of course, because if we don't, if we don't believe in something outside of ourselves, then what we do is we are um, putting all of our energy into grasping onto things for us. And it's one of the surest ways to be unhappy. The more that we see ourselves as the most important, the more unhappy we become. So this is really interesting because if we have some sort of spiritual belief, even if it's a belief in the universe and the belief in nature, then we have an understanding of uh, a community of um, you know human beings and an interplay of of our world and us that's bigger than ourselves. And it takes the focus off ourselves. But self-grasping, grasping onto ourselves is one of the sure ways to be unhappy. 
even though our society and our culture is constantly telling us, you know, particularly in the United States, this whole idea of individualism, it's consistently telling us to grasp onto things for ourselves. Mm. But interestingly, that is not going to help you to be happy. So atheists can be just as happy as non-atheists. Absolutely. Definitely. It's all about working with the mind. Mm. Working with the mind is not a religious uh, construct. Mm. Working with the mind is, you know, used across the board from all through all different cultures, through all different traditions. So without a doubt, an atheist can be happy and they should be happy. They deserve to be happy. Certainly. So you struggled with with happiness. You were, you know, you had depression. You, in one of your podcasts, you talked about you took a whole year to produce an album, I believe it was, some music, and uh, you were working, you were grinding for the year. When it was done, you kind of went into this depression because you were just so used to doing that, and you kind of came out of it. And you know, so as you take this journey to happiness, what made you? you achieved it what makes you turn it around and try to help others what what is that's a very big leap there and and the in my opinion the 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 note of a remarkable person so not only are they trying to do it but they're trying to help others do it what made you do that monique Mm, it's a funny story joey i was in the south of india i was doing a music project for the Dalai lama and i was living in this beautiful little town and every morning i would go up onto the rooftop of uh a guest house that I was staying at and I would do my meditation practice. And one day these two girls come to me, they see me at a cafe and they say to me, Hey, listen, you know, we see you meditating every morning on the rooftop. Will you teach us? And I looked at them and I said, absolutely not. I am not going to teach you to meditate. Hmm. And they came back for three days in a row. By this point I'd been, I'd been studying meditation for close to 15 years, very intensively but I'd never taught it and I had no idea how to teach it. So anyway, after three days of coming and asking me, I started to feel guilty and thought, gosh, this might be really bad that I'm saying no. So I let them come. They came to my rooftop. I said, come at eight o'clock the next morning. They came. I gave them what I believe was the worst meditation class anyone has ever given. (laughs) And then the next day they showed up again, but they showed up with two friends. And I was like, what are you doing here? And they said, well, we told our friends about the class and they wanted to come too. Hmm. And I was so frustrated with them because I just didn't know how to teach them that instead of teaching them to meditate, what I started to do was I talked to them about how and why meditation had completely changed my life. And in that moment, I started to understand just how excited I was about this particular skill that I had never spoken to anyone about before. In all the years, it was almost like a quiet secret thing that I did. So I I taught them that day. The next day, more friends showed up. And before I knew it, every morning at eight o'clock, there was around about 50 people on that rooftop wow. and I was teaching meditation. And what I saw was the shift it created in people across the board. So in the South of India, you get a lot of young um, British Uh, backpackers who are coming through who, you know, are really wanting to find themselves. But the real moment was there was a woman who stayed for two weeks. She stayed two weeks longer. She was Italian. She would have been in her 60s. And she was about to leave one day and she said, tomorrow I'm leaving India. And she said, I want you to know that I stayed here for two weeks longer to come to these classes. Hmm. I was brought up Catholic and I was led to believe that meditation was the work of the devil. Hmm. And I need to know that these two weeks have changed my life. And she cried. And I was so moved by this woman that I started to notice the difference that was happening in people. And I saw that helping other people was making me happier. Mm. It's one of the things that I teach. And so it was almost like it was choiceless. It was, you know, I I wouldn't put too much on me. You know, it was more like, Joey, it was like (laughs) I just began to fall in love with teaching what I'd learned. And it felt like 
it felt like the perfect, you know, closing of the circle of all these years of trying to help myself and trying to figure this out for myself so I could be happier. And now I was starting to see that there was the possibility to help other people and so that they wouldn't have to go through two decades of searching and traveling and all of that, that actually there was a set of skills and, and things that I'd learned that had helped me and maybe I could help other people. And the joy that I get from it, you know, where I wake up every morning and I love my students so much and I, I love teaching them. I love getting to know them. I love more than anything seeing their lives change. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a selfish offering because I get, I get so much joy from it myself. So yeah, that's how I ended up <laughs> teaching this purely by, by accident. What a wonderful story. Are you in contact with any of those students? Uh, I am actually. Yes, one of them. I am still in touch with her. Yes. Some of the things that makes you happy that I was really interested in seeing are uh, dogs and goats. <laughs> Joey, when you're in India, it's springtime when spring comes, right? Because I always love to live in the very, very poor parts of India because I you just don't get this experience and I love it. And springtime comes and the goats are all running free and there are just baby goats everywhere. And you can just, and they're all pretty tame. So you can just go and pick up a baby goat. I don't know what it is about a baby goat, but baby goats with their big, long ears, almost as long as a rabbit. And you just pick them up like a puppy and <laughs> snuggle them and they love it. And they follow you around. They just they're so fun. And I don't know, it's just something that we don't get to be around. We don't get to experience goats in this way, but they're so joyful. You know, when you're around them, if there's a chair, they'll just jump on the chair and they'll chase each other around and they'll play. They're, they're very, very funny. So hmm. I, 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 they, they in, in, instantly lift, lift my joy levels without a doubt. I just, I love interacting with them and they're, they're hilarious. I don't have a lot of experience with ghosts, certainly with dogs. Uh, I ended up being in the West and spending some time in Europe, but uh, just a very different attitude towards animals altogether, obviously, than India. Uh, you know, on the podcast, we talk a lot about discipline. You know, um, I lost a lot of weight. People ask me how I did it. You know, uh, I just say, you know, I got focused and disciplined. Does discipline play a role at all in happiness? Definitely, without a doubt. But I have a whole theory about discipline, Joey, and that like, I'm a very disciplined person, mm. okay? I'm really disciplined in a lot of areas of my life. And there are other areas where I'm completely undisciplined. Mm. And I believe that discipline is all about something being juicy enough that the pain of staying where you're at is bigger than the pain of what you need to do to get where you want to go. Hmm. So I'll give you an example. Uh, I wake up every morning at five o'clock in the morning. Now I'm not naturally a morning person and to train myself into waking up at five o'clock in the morning wasn't so easy, but I do it because if I wake up at five o'clock in the morning, I can go outside and where I live, the, the stars are just unbelievable. So I get my first joyful thing of seeing this extraordinary night sky. Then in the quiet of the early morning, I get to do my practices, my meditation practice. And then by the time I'm ready to start work at seven o'clock in the morning, which I do, I'm set to go, right? I'm all good to go. I have a really good day of work and then I can finish early and have the afternoon to myself. Mm. I have to go to bed earlier probably than most people are most people would to ensure that I wake up at five o'clock in the morning. But the pain of going to bed early is completely outweighed by the joy of all the things that I get to experience if I get myself up at five o'clock in the morning. Hmm. And this is where I don't call it discipline. I have a name for it, which is choose a plan. It's like, it's basically, what is it that I'm choosing? <laughs> I have a discipline around social media. Yes. Only because I know that social media is set up to suck me in and 
take away my conscious choice. So I choose a plan around it as well. I set either a timer if I'm going to go on, or ideally I, I do it on my iPad where I have a, a, a limit, right? There's, I can set this thing up, the 10 minute limit and the whole thing shuts down and it helps me to make that choice to walk away. So that's how I set things up in my life. How can I set myself up so that I'm choosing what is going to make me happy rather than falling into habits just because everybody else is doing it and then wondering why I'm miserable. Hmm. So again, that's getting to know ourselves, right? You had the choose a plan really to lose weight because you chose the gain over the pain. The pain had become too big for you and you wanted to choose something different. So you obviously made it for yourself so that where you were going looked so good that you would rather go through the pain of getting there than stay with the pain of where you were right now. Hmm. And that's and that's how I see it. We, we, we naturally want to move away from pain. We do. We always do. So we have to set things up for ourselves. If I was to wake up at seven o'clock in the morning and I didn't start work till nine, I probably wouldn't be finished till six and then my day would be over. I would fall. I would then be so tired. I'd probably just watch TV. I'd go to bed late. I'd start again. And that cycle isn't good for me. Wow. So the cycle that I have is really good for me, even though it's not when the alarm goes off at five o'clock in the morning, I'm not thrilled if I haven't had a good night's sleep right? So I set myself up the night before to get a good night's sleep so that when I wake up at five o'clock, I feel good. And when I'm sitting there and I'm like, I just want to read one more page of my book, or I just want to watch one more thing. I say to myself, what is the pain going to be tomorrow at five o'clock when that alarm goes off? Do you want the pain now of shutting this down? Or do you want the bigger pain, which will be that tomorrow you're not going to feel so good? Okay, all of a sudden, what looks like a discipline is just a choose a plan. Let me let me put that YouTube video away or that Netflix series or that book and now let me get myself to sleep so that tomorrow I have an awesome day and that's what I'm choosing. It looks disciplined, but it's not really. It's just making really good choices for myself. Uh, is this your term, choose a plan? Yeah. <laughs> I love it, yeah. I often get pushback with discipline saying, you know, uh, compassion is more important or, you know, uh, empathy is more important. And I, I'm not, I don't really debate importance. I just, you know, I, I, that's what I use to, to, to lose the weight, just discipline and focus. But it's interesting. The doctor said, you know, if you don't lose the weight, I was pre-diabetic and pre-hypertensive. If you don't lose it, you're not going to see your daughter graduate. So I chose to see my daughter graduate. So it's very interesting. You kind of, uh, you're just choosing one, a lesser pain from the greater. It's a good way to look at it. Exactly. Exactly. So that's where your motivation comes from. You know, your motivation. I, I was just uh, coaching a client yesterday and it was, we had the same conversation, Right. He said, I grew up believing that I was lazy and I have a fear that I'm lazy. Mm. And, and yet we looked at, he did the happiness baseline. He completed it in eight weeks without a problem. And he said, I've got this golf training program on my computer. It sat there for two years. I've not been able to do it. Mm. I, I think I'm lazy. And what we saw was that actually... When he did the happiness baseline, he was at a low point in his life and there was a level of desperation. So the pain of staying where he was at and continuing like that was, was uh, worse than actually taking steps to shift it. Hmm. Whereas with the golf class, there's no desperation. In fact, I said to him, get it off your computer. You're never going to do it, <laughs> right? Unless someone came along and said to you, created some sort of false pain for you. If you don't do this course, it's going to be really painful. Like I, I literally said to him, if I came to you and said, in two months, if you don't do this course, in two months time, you're going to die. Would you do it? Mm. He's like, yes, I do it. Of course, Right. 
And so this is where we can be really powerful in setting up false pain. If we're motivated, we're either motivated by by gain or by pain. And it's really powerful to see which is it for us. If we're motivated by pain, which clearly you are, the doctor giving you this is much more painful than someone saying, hey, listen, if you do this work, you're going to look gorgeous and you're really you're going to look really handsome and everyone's going to fall in love with you. All of those things, you'll be able to walk up a hill more easily. All those things, right? Don't mean anything to you. What is powerful is here's this pain. I've got two pains. One's bigger than the other. Mm. Let me choose the lesser pain. And that is where your brain automatically goes towards the lesser pain. So you can you can set yourself up to work with that in all sorts of ways so that you create you create pain for yourself. If I keep going down this path, what is it going to look like? And is it easier actually for me just to do some work? Boy, that really simplifies it, really, really brings it down. Fascinating viewpoint, Monique. Monique Rhodes, what motivates you? I The first thing I want to say is love. I'm motivated by being in relationship with loving relationships with people, mm. loving relationship with my dog, helping people is a service, it's an act of love, learning how to be more loving, you know? Like in all of all of the things that that I teach and that I study is all about how can I show up as a more loving person in the world? And that motivates me. Is love a synonym for happiness? No, I don't think so. But I think that the more loving we are, the happier we are. Mm. Yes, said a mouthful there. And, you know, it's amazing as I see, you know, some of the largest issues that we have, certainly in the West, there's, you know, obesity, overweight, you know, mental health. And I mean, if we were to all, you know, gain and focus on just your level of happiness, wouldn't those other things start to correct themselves? You can't be happy if you're unhealthy. You can't be happy unless you're, you know, you're loving Absolutely. It's actually all about loving ourselves and other people. Mm. If we lived in a world where the focus was less on grasping for ourselves and was more about truly loving ourselves, and then when we have that loving relationship with ourselves, extending that to other people, our planet wouldn't be in the nightmare it's in. Mm. Our bodies wouldn't be in the nightmare they're in. Our minds wouldn't be in the nightmares that they're in. That's how I see it, which is why love is the big motivator for me. How well put. And imagine if we could all adopt such a, such a viewpoint, how, how, how things would be different. Uh, Monique, how do you measure success? It's the same thing. Hmm. Success to me is being in alignment with your values. I think that most people aren't actually conscious of what their values are. They may be living values of other people. They may be living values that are of their culture or their religion. To consciously choose what it is that you value, to be aware of those values, and then to live within those values is a successful life. Mm. That's what I believe. And, and not only do you practice it, but you help others achieve it, which again, you know, remarkably, those students that came to you there in India has really turned in. How long ago was that? That was about eight years ago. Wow. Wow. It's just, it's, you know, when I lost all the weight, people would ask me, you know, how'd you do it? Like there was some secret or something, you know? And I, I said, this, but I, I've never taken the chance. I, I don't really teach others to lose weight because I kind of did it myself. I did, I had my own way of dealing with it, but it just takes a remarkable person like yourself to, to turn it around. And I get, that's one of the goals of talking to people like yourself is that hopefully people are listening and they, they can understand happiness just a little bit differently and even better 
reach out to you and, and perhaps achieve it that way. How can people get in touch with you, Monique Rhodes? Yeah, absolutely. I do a podcast every day called In Your Right Mind. It's great. And I have my website, MoniqueRhodes.com. Come, come and find me. I'm very involved with my students, Joey. So if you come and learn with me, there's more than likely you'll get to know me a little bit personally. I get really involved because I want to be able to help and guide people as much as possible. Um, I don't think it's remarkable what I'm doing, Joey. Mm. I think that each of us play our our particular part and our particular role. And I feel that I was incredibly blessed to have a life where I I sought different people out who taught me things. And I, in a lot of ways, I feel now like it's it, it's my obligation to pass this on, not in a heavy way, but just mm. in a in a joyful way is that you know, to not hold it all to myself, to not take this for myself, but to actually pass that on. And I, I feel that that's a very natural evolution more than anything. And, I, and a, a deep honor, a deep honor, Joey, to do it. What a wonderful, wonderful antidote and, and attitude. I, I really love it. Monique, thank you so much for your time today. I really enjoyed this conversation. I hope one day we get to see each other face to face, maybe have a, a cup of coffee. I know you've got great vineyards there in New Zealand. Are you in New Zealand now? I'm in New Zealand right now, heading out of here in a few weeks. Ah, I'm see. heading back to, I need to be closer to the state. So heading back in that general direction. I see. Very good. Thank you so much. Uh, be well, be healthy, and maybe one day we'll have a face to face and a cup of coffee. You be well. Thank you, Joey. See you soon. Bye now. Thank you for listening and or viewing Joey Pinn's Discipline Conversations. Please share this episode with one or two of your friends who you think may benefit from the episode. Our website, www.joeypins.com. There you find lots of resources and you could join our mailing list. Please follow us on all our social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Podcast information, the video version of our podcast is on YouTube. Please subscribe. Audio is on all major podcasting platforms. Please follow them. And if you like it, please consider giving five-star rating. We'd really appreciate that. Would you like to financially support the podcast? You can go to our Patreon site. Consider five, ten, or twenty dollars a month. There's all kind of plans that we have there. It's like a one-time payment. What is this podcast episode worth to you? You be the judge. You can go to our PayPal account to do that as well. Thank you again for listening or watching Joey Pinn's Discipline Conversations.